the word of faith movement really doesn't have any real authoritative leader. There is no authoritative document, no book that we can go to to get the official doctrines. What we have is a collection of people who are loosely uh, affiliated with this movement who have teachings that are <laughs> very much in common with each other. And it's kind of a, a little gang of them. They all play off each other. They're all good. Most of them are good friends, uh, although there are some bickering amongst them. They play off each other's doctrines, and it, it, there's this one upsmanship that happens where one will bust out some secret revelation from God, and then <laughs> a year or two later, another one will come along and bust out something even more outrageous, uh, playing off the same idea as previously revealed by one of the other ones. Jesus didn't pay for your sins completely on the cross. He had to go to hell and suffer in hell for three days, taking on the sin nature of Satan for you to be saved. You don't want to question them. What's up with this health and wealth gospel? Why are some of these pastors saying that if you're saved, you should be healthy? And if you're not healthy, you're not saved. This movement doesn't have any specific authoritative writing. I mean, there, there's a couple magazines that um, carry a lot of this do doctrine. Magazines like Charisma, Believer's Voice of Victory from uh, Kenneth Copeland's ministry, Kenneth Hagen's magazine, The Word of Faith. Uh, you can get a lot of this doctrine. Oh, boy. Oh, some of you are going to get mad now. You're going to find a ton of this doctrine on TBN and Daystar. In fact, just about everything you see on TBN is somehow affiliated with this movement. I hate to say it, guys, but it's the truth. Not all word faith teachers accept all of these doctrines, but most of them do. These are generally accepted amongst this word of faith uh, uh, movement. First and foremost, and I kind of mentioned this, the idea of positive confession. It's the whole idea that you use your words to create the reality of the world around you. These people will teach things like, or say things like, even though they're dying of cancer, I am healthy. I'm doing great. They might be poor. They might be ridiculously poor, don't have a job, and they'll be saying things like, I am wealthy. I own a Corvette. I am successful. I am doing great. This is witchcraft. You're trying to back God into a corner and manipulate him into doing what you want him to do. There's another doctrine that they often uh, agree upon is this whole idea that we're little gods. I mean, they're saying things like, I am, and I am everything that Christ was. Okay. Um, <laughs> a lot of them agree on the fact, or fact, the idea that the spiritual death of Jesus is actually what atoned for our sins. I mentioned that earlier, this whole idea that Jesus dying on the cross, the blood he shed on the cross was not enough. And apparently when Jesus said it is finished, it wasn't finished. It wasn't enough. Jesus had to go to hell and suffer torment in hell. Okay, at the hands of Satan. And after he had suffered three days of torment in hell, then our sins were paid for. That's when it really was finished. And another thing we talked about earlier, this whole idea of revelation knowledge, this concept of God revealing secret doctrines, a.k.a. Gnosticism. I mean, that's what it is, guys. Let's face it. It's Gnosticism. It's this idea that God gives you some secret knowledge that other pastors, other teachers don't have. Yes, I'll read you a quote where Joyce Myers, uh, yeah, she's the first one I just named a name. She's the, she actually said that you cannot be saved unless you believe not only in what Jesus did on the cross, but also that Christ suffered in hell. This whole gospel of health. The idea that, and we talked about this a little bit already, the whole idea that 
On the cross, Jesus also paid for your health. By his stripes, you are healed. They believe that if you're saved, you're going to be healthy. A gospel of wealth. God's intention for you is that you would be healthy and wealthy. And if you're saved, God's going to make you healthy and wealthy. You're going to see... You're going to see names and hear names like Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Creflo, give me a dollar. Oh, I'm sorry. Creflo Dollar, Jesse Duplantis, uh, Todd Bentley's loosely affiliated with this movement, Rick Joyner, Paul Crouch, Jan Crouch, Marilyn Hickey, Paul Kane, John Avanzini, Joyce Meyer, Mike Murdoch, Rod Parsley, R.W. Shambach, T.B. Joshua, T.D. Jakes, and guys, even people like, there's going to be some gasps, even people like Joel Osteen and Beth Moore are loosely affiliated with this word of faith doctrine. They do not buy into all of the nonsense that we're going to go into, but they do have certain aspects of this uh, word of faith movement integrated into their their teachings and their doctrines. You're also going to see a lot of these peripheral movements, different movements that are affiliated with the word of faith, like Joel's Army, the Latter Day Reign, Dominionism, this whole new apostolic reformation. There, they actually will teach things like you need to confess things into existence. Don't pray it into existence. That's showing God you don't believe. You, you claim it. You declare it. You claim that healing. You declare that you're prosperous. And thus, just like shamanism, the words they speak become the vehicles of spiritual power. And then what happens? You claim the power of God. In a different quote, straight from the same book, that Seduction of Christianity, uh, Dave Hunt says this about the occult roots of the Word of Faith movement. He says, The mental images that one is able to picture or visualize are no longer looked upon as mere figments of the mind, but as reality created by the mind that can even impact the physical world. The intimate relationship between thinking, speaking, and seeing, and the power thereby produced, has formed the basis of occult theory for thousands of years. Going on, the metaphysical philosophy underlying positive thinking and possibility thinking, as well as major aspects of the positive confession movement, is founded upon the alleged power inherent within the thoughts and words. Where does this movement start? I mean, how did this all get started? Well, most people think that it was started by Kenneth Hagen. And although that's pretty much true, it goes back a little farther as far as the doctrine goes. Because Kenneth Hagen plagiarized from another guy. He got most of his material from a character named E.W. Kenyon. And like I said, Kenneth Hagin copied most of his doctrines uh, originally from this E.W. Kenyon. And so let's go back and let's look at this E.W. Kenyon just so we can get a foundation here. And then we'll move forward and look at some of the things that these guys are saying. So E.W. Kenyon started off as a Methodist, and he affiliated himself with the Baptists as well, and then he started taking on some ecumenical um, qualities about him. And right around this same time, he moved away from his Methodist beliefs and started moving into Pentecostalism. And this is where he started to get a little bit off base. He started combining his Christian beliefs with metaphysical uh, uh, cultish beliefs like Christian science, 
the New Thought Theology, Unity School of Christianity, uh, sources like this. And he really looked up to, he was very interested in, the teachings of a Phineas P. Quimby. (laughs) And some of you, your antennas just went up. And yeah, Phineas Quimby, does the uni... Do any of you guys remember that character? He's come up in this podcast before. He's the guy uh, when Mary Baker Eddy of Christian Science, she had all kinds of spine problems, and she started seeing this metaphysical healer named Phineas P. Quimby. And Quimby had these strange ideas that sickness, did not exist. Death did not exist. And he referred to them as, if I remember correctly, the science of Christianity. And so she picked up, Mary Baker Eddy picked up many of her same bizarre beliefs that sickness, pain, suffering, death exist in the mind. It's an illusion that can be overcome with correct thinking and and correct speaking. Well, Phineas P. Quimby also had a fairly dramatic effect on this E.W. Kenyon. Now, Quimby died uh, shortly before Kenyon was born, I believe. Uh, uh, Quimby lived uh, early, like 1800 to 1866, I believe is when he died. And Kenyon, if I, if I'm reading this correctly, was born somewhere around 67, 1867. So at this point, fin- Phineas had passed on and not to a better place. And E.W. Kenyon picked up his teachings and started buying into this whole idea of your words and your correct thinking dictate the world. They change. They actually change the physical world around you. The Word of Faith movement has many similarities to Christian science. And so Kenyon believed in this this whole positive confession and correct thinking change the world around you. And so this these sicknesses that you're having – They're just simply symptoms, they're illusions, and they can be overcome. In fact, Kenyon also taught that believers would not die, but rather they would just wear out and fall asleep. And you'll see that as we go forward, there are a lot of these Word of Faith teachers that have similar type beliefs. And so moving forward, Kenneth Hagin although he is not the official founder of the Word of Faith movement, everybody points at him. You know, as far as chronologically goes, there were other characters, but Kenneth Hagin is is the guy that really got the Word of Faith movement going. In fact, people often refer to him as the father of the Word of Faith movement and also um, the granddaddy of faith healers and faith teachers. (laughs) <laughs> so, Kenneth Hagin, uh, he was born as a premature child, and he had all kinds of health problems. Kenneth Hagin claims that he received the Holy Ghost in 1933 after he nearly died, apparently, and <laughs> he claims that he was, uh, well, he witnessed the horrors of hell three times, and in 1934, Kenneth Hagin claims to have had a vision. He had a lot of those that he claims, Uh, and in this vision, there was a scripture, a passage of scripture that was very prominent, and this scripture is what he fashioned his faith theology on uh, in, in the years to come. His faith principle, his theology on this whole Word of Faith movement, he fashioned it off this scripture, Mark chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, 
uh, Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So, Kenneth Hagin uses this scripture to build his theology that he calls the faith principle. And the basic idea of this faith principle is this. Believe it in your heart, say it with your mouth, and you will have whatsoever you confess. Hagen is also, uh, he's known for having visions. In one of his visions, and I'm telling you this just so you can kind of get an idea of what kind of character we're dealing with here. Uh, he had a vision where he was walking with Jesus, and they were talking. And then a demon monkey showed up and started terrorizing them. <laughs> and Jesus, Jesus was unable to control the monkey. Jesus is demoted. He's put down. His, his divinity, his power, the awesomeness of our creator, Jesus, who created the heavens and the earth, is put down, all right, belittled. And so here we have Jesus. He's unable to control the little demon monkey, okay? But then Hagen steps in and saves the day. He rebukes the demon in Jesus' name, you know, because, oh, boy, these guys are always running around like heroes. Uh, he rebukes the demon in Jesus' name, and <laughs> as it turns out, Jesus was unable to get the job done, but Hagen, hey, you know, he, he, he had it going on. And so moving on here, Kenneth Hagen is also the guy that, for the most part, originated this whole you are little gods doctrine. Uh, moving on to Kenneth Hagin's son, since we're talking about Hagin here, Kenneth Jr., uh, he's carrying on his father's work. He's the pastor of Rima Bible Church, uh, and he's also the head of the school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He says that he's had eight personal visits from Jesus Christ. Kenneth Jr. also has bizarre doctrines, just like his daddy. Um, stuff like this. He said this, You are as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was. Kenneth Hagin's protege, the guy, his successor, everybody pretty much considers Kenneth Copeland. Hagen's successor. So <laughs> we're going from one Kenneth to another Kenneth. And Kenneth Copeland and his wife Gloria, uh, they're considered two of the movements, movements more intellectual leaders. <laughs> and these guys have built a multi-million dollar empire from their Christian media that they put out. Oh, okay. So Kenneth Copeland was, uh, he's one of those guys, yet again, who believes that us Christians are little gods. And he called us believers part of what he called the God class. We're all part of the God class. And uh, moving on, he claims that the Holy Spirit personally told him, told him this. Holy Spirit says, a born-again man and he's talking about Jesus, defeated Satan. You are the very, you are the very copy of that one. So Copeland, incredulous, he asks the Holy Spirit, well, now you don't mean that I could have done the same thing. And the Holy Spirit, Spirit says back, oh yeah, if you had the knowledge of the word of God that he did, because you're a reborn man too. Copeland teaches that this God class, uh, it began with Adam, but 
Adam gave it up when he bowed the knee to Satan. And so once he bowed the knee to Satan, he willingly gave up his his standing as one of the God class and he submitted himself to Satan. Okay? Makes sense so far. And so when a person then becomes a believer of Jesus Christ, and, and I'm cool with that part, but then they become part of the God class again. They regain their God status. Oakland goes way too far with this. I mean, he's always calling himself, I am. Okay, that is blasphemy. You can't do that. And I'm, well, we're not talking about capital I, lowercase a, lowercase m. We're saying capital I, capital A, capital M. I am. I am that I am. How could you do that? Again, putting down God, putting down Jesus, who said before Abraham was, I am. So let's talk about Jesse Duplantis. Jesse Duplantis, quite a character. He also claims to have personal visits from Christ. And so Duplantis says this. He says, the very first thing on Jesus' agenda was to get rid of poverty. All right, and this is the same guy who claims that he was brought to heaven and King David himself, <laughs> he went to heaven and he met with King David. And this is what King David said. He said that he regretted writing some of the Psalms. Again, this time he's not putting down God. He's putting down the Bible. Has the audacity to say that at one point <laughs> he sensed that Jesus was really sad. Okay, Jesus was having a bad day. He was really sad. And Jesse Duplantis says, well, Jesus, what's wrong? And <laughs> the creator of the heavens and the earth, you know, the Alpha and Omega, God himself says, I need you, boy. So, again, this whole idea of these guys, they're always getting personal visits from Jesus, and the Holy Spirit told them this and that, and they're always magnifying themselves, magnifying man, and putting Jesus down, putting the Holy Spirit down, and putting down the Word of God. And, and, and another thing you're going to see them do as we go here is they put down knowledge, as in thinking things through, as in knowing your Bible. I just want to add to what Michael has said in regards to the Word of Faith, that when I had gone back to church um, after having leukemia and uh, having contemplated suicide, having given God full control over my life, I went back to church, and it happened to be a Word of Faith church, and at the time, I didn't know the difference. And the first time that I went, I believe that I was healed of my leukemia. And it was later in that church that I actually felt God calling me into ministry. I saw a lot of powerful things there. I saw a lot of uh, prayers answered, and I, I see... Um, a sincerity in terms of a belief that God could do miraculous things, uh, a requesting and prayers for to, to see God do miraculous things and a desire to be a, a part of that. And so, um, but I also have a personal experience with the downside of the doctrine. And I realize now that what I was doing uh, was I was actually practicing witchcraft. Um, and I didn't know any better. I was a younger, younger Christian. I was a teenager and uh, believed that I had actually been healed in my leukemia or that God was in the process. And um, 
then I, I developed a, an issue where my body stopped, started producing uh, antibodies against my own platelets. And they tried all sorts of medication, uh, really expensive treatments, and the only thing left for them to do was to take out my spleen. And I went back to this same church after I had already been, you know, far removed from that church, um, gone on to ministry and um, in various other churches. And uh, But I, I went back and I had that same pastor pray for me. Uh, I started reading a book called Christ the Healer by a guy whose last name is Bosworth. I started confessing that uh, Jesus had made me whole. He had healed me. I was thanking him in advance for what he was going to do. I, I, I basically tried every single formulaic uh, thing, quoted every verse on healing I could possibly find, and um, I was determined that I wasn't going to go under the knife. But you know what happened? I went under the knife. And I realized that that was one of the most powerful things that could have happened for me and that God could have done for me. And it's because um, I realized that God is the healer under all circumstances. Sometimes he does supernaturally heal. And I do believe I was healed of my leukemia very supernaturally. Sometimes he heals using doctors. Sometimes he heals using natural things from his creation. Uh, sometimes he heals using uh, the wisdom that he's given men to uh, create different um, means by which we might be healed. And all of it is God. And we, we shouldn't have this concept that says that if you are a Christian then God will do this or that. Or if you are a Christian, that you should do this or that. And really all of these groups um, that we've been hearing about and learning about together, um, all of these groups teach one or both of those things. And I just wanted to share that story with you guys. Um, and I also wanted to share it with you to show that God is able to work in an individual within these movements. All of them that we've been talking about, any religion, any background, any worldview, God is able to reach the individual to work in their life and to do some very powerful things in their life, even while they're a part of these movements. He did in my life. I'm grateful that I'm not a part of the Word of Faith anymore. I don't believe anything that they teach anymore. But I'm grateful for the experience that I had there. And I'm grateful that God met me there. Thanks, guys. If you want access to complete conversations and interviews that I've done with other people as well as written articles either my, by myself or articles I'm accessing for further research or if you just want to get in front of the line for Q&A check out our Patreon page in the link in the description down below.